so a few less, few fewer people Sunday morning and Saturday nights. Fewer people on time then. Let's see. You think some people are going to come? You told them the cake is coming at 11.30. So people are going to try to time the minimum amount. They come exactly often, 15 minutes before the break. Yeah, I know. Strategic planning. Strategic. The minimum amount of Dharma teachings to endure in order to get the cake. <clears throat> I'm saying this because the video is still on. <laughs> I'm just uh, filling time. Or is it on? It's on, my Oh, okay. you told You're me to lie. <laughs> it's okay, It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, Shanti, you have to tell me to let go. I'm holding on. When do I let go? <clears throat> okay, that will be edited out. Alright, so welcome everyone for our uh, intimate session, intimate Sunday morning session. So, um, again, as we mentioned last night, this is our first kind of weekend of events since the beginning of the pandemic. So it's uh, really great to be here in person. Um, so we tried to uh, schedule sort of three different types of sessions. We did the, the prayers and practices for uh, the global situation, uh, particularly uh, to help with the war in, in Ukraine, as well as the uh, you know, ongoing uh, pandemic and then all the other problems, like economic problems, problems of the environment, uh, natural disasters, and so forth. And then uh, last night we had one uh, kind of lecture on how to integrate Buddhism into uh, daily life. How was that? Yeah? You learned something? Okay. I don't know, of course. I don't know. Um, and now, we are going to uh, go in a little, little bit of depth. Uh, let's see how much we can do in uh, we have a little bit more than two hours. And we're going to go over uh, one very important text uh, written by the great Tibetan master. So the three principles of the path. So um, before we jump into the text, let's just do what we normally do and adjust our motivation, thinking that the purpose of my life is to benefit all sinning beings. And in order to benefit sinning beings in the best way, right? So we even know this from a worldly context, the more skills, the more qualities we have then the more we're able to offer it to others. Okay. And so, um, if we were able to develop all of our internal qualities to their highest extent, then we'd be uh, in the best position to uh, benefit beings in the most uh, kind of profound way. And so, uh, that development of our inner qualities to their highest potential is just what we call the state of Buddha, the state of enlightenment. It's a uh, a uh, potential that we all have to become enlightened. And so, so now, you know, in order to awaken that potential, uh, we need to have, uh, well, the kind of inner condition of having a, a body, mind, intelligence, you know, that's able uh, to uh, contemplate the teachings. We also need the outer condition of being in a time and a place where uh, such teachings exist you know, in, in, in the place that we are. And so now we have those in our inner conditions. So because of that, we need to then uh, make best use of this opportunity that we have because having all these factors that allow us to make progress along the path to uh, enlightenment is actually a very rare thing, uh, both in the world today and then especially thinking historically, um, it's a very rare and precious opportunity that we have. So, we're going to now use that opportunity, not just for our own benefit,
but for the benefit of all sane beings, thinking that we're going to make the utmost progress on the path of enlightenment. Therefore, we're going to learn about all these stages. What practices do we do? How do we become enlightened? And therefore, we're going to listen to this teaching here today. And even at the beginning, we, we think, you know, due, the, due to the efforts of our, you know, listening to and contemplating these teachings, may I quickly achieve the state of enlightenment so I can lead all other sending beings to do the same thing. Okay? Alright. Okay, so you all have the uh, gold prayer book. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is actually um, a little bit older translation, it's on page 141. So, let's just jump into that. And, um, there is a newer translation. This translation has been revised by Thomas of Lancashire. And so, um, it's available for free download on the FMT uh, website. Um, but in any case, I am going to uh, use both of them. And uh, where there are differences, we can talk about it. Okay? All right. So, um, perhaps, to just give a bit of context, okay? Uh, when we talk the three principles of the path, okay? Path, Lam, right? So in Tibetan, this text is called Lam So Nam Sum, right? So Lam is the path, okay? So this path metaphor is uh, used again and again, right? And um, we can think, right? The path, road, it's like a journey, right? We are trying to get to a certain destination and, uh, you know, we would take a, a road or a path to get there. This is kind of in, in the real physical world. Uh, here, the path that we're talking about is the path to enlightenment. So our destination isn't the location, but a level of, uh, we can say, development of the mind. And uh, this is characterized, as I mentioned, uh, as the complete development of all the qualities and the abandonment of all faults of the mind. Okay? So that's the destination we're trying to go to. Right? Um, so, uh, unlike the physical path where you, you know, uh, go in some kind of you know, vehicle, bicycle, or maybe even your feet, right, to, to take you there. Uh, here, since the path is an internal, or sorry, the destination is an internal state of development, what are the uh, means by which we develop our mind? Okay? And so, uh, basically, what the Buddha taught uh, are all of these uh, practices, all of these techniques to transform our mind, to uh, you know, take it from where we are now to that end goal of enlightenment. And historically, uh, how he did that, uh, you know, he taught. And those teachings then formed the sutras. And we mentioned last night, but uh, on the sort of, kind of bookcase there, behind the statues, you see those orange, I don't know what they are, right? If you look at it, it's like, what is that? So actually, we mentioned, right, those are orange pieces of cloth that are wrapped around uh, volumes of scripture. So there's 108 volumes of the sutras. And, um, well, if you've had any experience reading the sutras, um, how the teachings were, were given then, the Buddha, as he uh, traveled throughout you know, northern India, primarily, uh, then would be asked questions, and he would answer the question, and then uh, his attendant, Ananda, who traveled with him wherever he went, and then sort of, he had a, a perfect memory, it is said, and would then remember everything in that exchange with the Buddha and whoever he was talking to. 
and then later uh, those were those were kind of uh, you know, recorded, passed down through the generations. Eventually, they were put down on paper, and now the whole canon of scriptures uh, exists in the Tibetan language. Mm. And uh, so, since the, the Buddha was motivated with, with a wish of compassion, wanting sending beings to be free from suffering, right? and seeing, we'll get to this a little bit later, seeing how the, the root cause of suffering is also in the mind. And we touched on this last night, but it's the, the root of suffering is our uh, ignorant mind that grasps onto a mode of existence of phenomena that is distorted. It's a misconception of reality. Um, so, the Buddha then wanted to alleviate this uh, ignorant mind. Doing that by teaching the, the, the wisdom of reality. And as we were saying last night in the context about why we ourselves need to also become enlightened, it's because that ultimate nature of reality is so subtle, so profound, that to guide another being to realize that within their own mind stream, uh, one needs to be extremely skilled as a teacher. And especially, uh, it would be very helpful to have a level of clairvoyance that can see the other person's mental dispositions, see their karma, and see which words will be most effective for them. Hmm. So, then, in the Buddhist teachings, since there was this kind of, always a kind of question and answer, right, that formed the basis of the sutra, now, when we uh, aspire to follow in the footsteps of the Buddha and become 2,000, almost 600 years later, and uh, we look at the sutras, well, it's a little bit difficult. Right? Or maybe more than a little bit. It's very difficult. Because one, um, we were saying yesterday, each one of those volumes has about 1,200 pages. Right? Yeah. So, who has time, and there's 108 volumes, so who has time to read, I don't know, which is that? Right? So just time-wise, to get through all that, right? And if you're like me, you know, it's like, you maybe you understand one somewhat, and then you get to Sutra number 35, and you're like, wait a minute, what has been said earlier, right? So our memory is bad, we don't have time to read all these things, and uh, more so, you know, you're saying due to the power of his omniscience, he would then tailor his answers to exactly fit the needs of the person right in front of him. So, you know, um, just to take a kind of worldly example, right, you can imagine a doctor who sees many patients in a day and the doctor is asked by all his patients, oh, what kind of diet is best and if the doctor, you know, sees your disposition, they might, you know, recommend you um, to eat a certain kind of diet, another person another kind of diet, and so forth. Then if you just saw at the end, you would say, what the heck? The doctor is saying for this person to eat, uh, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, a lot of, yeah, anyway, anyway, anyway right? And he said, this doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. He keeps contradicting himself. Then we can get to the point where we say, oh, well, this doctor doesn't know what he's talking about, and therefore I'm not going to follow any of this advice. So, given some of these mm, practical issues, then, <clears throat> after <coughs> the Buddha uh, passed away, there then, you know, the Buddha taught his disciples, who in turn had disciples themselves. They then taught their disciples and so forth, right? And it went on through the generations. And so then, you know, these further 
generations of masters knowing their students, knowing their needs, would then sort of tailor their message to meet the needs of their students. <clears throat> it's natural. Any, any uh, sort of teacher worth his or her weight would do that. Um, so then gradually the commentaries of the Buddhist uh, sutras then also formed. And so in those wrapped texts, there's 108 volumes of the sutras, and then the, the great Indian masters, they composed, well now it's in 215 volumes, so about double the amount of the sutras. Right? Which makes sense, if you're going to commentate on something, usually the commentary is trying to make the original thing more clear, if the commentator is doing a good job, right? So you would typically need more words to explain fewer words. That's at least what I, what I tell myself when I was on for hours and hours, right? Okay? All right. So then, in those um, commentaries, right, um, yeah, mm, there's a few that then sought to arrange the teachings in a kind of order meant for practice. Um, but this uh, style, okay, so some of the commentaries were sort of based on the subject matter. Okay? And it would just talk about uh, Abhidharma whatever the subject matter was, it would go by that. But then, uh, actually in Tibet, uh, there's a, a great Indian master called Atisha, <clears throat> Atisha Dibhamkara, and he um, went to Tibet during a time when the, the teachings of Buddhism had declined, and there was then a lot of confusion <clears throat> because, well, without getting into the whole history of it, the Buddhism had spread um, twice in a bigger way, right? The first time, uh, yesterday we, we went over to Paris by Pamisambhava, and we talked about how Pamisambhava was instrumental in helping to establish Buddhism. So, after it was originally established, then, anyway, it went into decline again, because, uh, well, one of the, the great kings was murdered by one of his jealous uh, relatives who was a big promoter. Oh, sorry, the king was a big promoter of the Dharma, so this um, Lang Dharma, he's called, then, uh, you know, also killed many of the, the monks who had been uh, kind of the supporters of the king. So then, after that happened, the Buddhism went into decline, and uh, disarray, and then later, uh, what's that? Yes. So that was all before Ram Dharma came. Then Ram Dharma wiped everything out, and then uh, after Ram Dharma himself died then they tried to reestablish Buddhism because a lot of wrong views came up. And so they, they invited the great Indian master Atisha to come, and um, there's a long story about that, <laughs> but when he finally made it to Tibet, uh, then he was, he was asked to compose a text that would help dispel some of the wrong views or questions, doubts that had come up. And a lot of the doubts that came up were surrounding, uh, you know, how some of the things, when you just look look at it, appear to be contradictory, you know, like the contradictory advice that a doctor would give, right? Because there are, you know, different levels of vows. There's the monastic vows. There's bodhisattva vows and the vows of the Vajrayana practitioner. We'll touch on that perhaps later. So anyway, these questions came up. So, hmm. 
Atisha then composed a text called Lamp to the Path, Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment. Okay, so here we have Path. Yeah, so uh, Lamp is Drun, so it's, you know, John Chukulam Drun. Okay, and uh, that then uh, kind of crystallized and formed the basis of a, of a whole new genre of Buddhist teaching um, called these stages of path. Or Lam Rim, Lam path, Rim stages. Okay. Um, so then, for those of you who have been around uh, a bit more in, in these circles, uh, you'll know that um, there's 18 main commentaries in this Lam Rim genre, and His Holiness the Lama uh, gave the, the transmission of all of them uh, some years back. Um, 2013, yeah, okay, it's over a number of years in the monasteries here in Kanata. So, uh, in any case, just giving the context, right? Because now, this three principles of path, okay, it's one of the, the shortest ones. Um, it's one of the shortest ones. Just coming in, I think 14 stanzas, yeah, 14 stanzas. But the, the, the benefit of this kind of uh, genre is that all of the, the Buddhist teachings, as was described in the 108 sutras, 100 volumes of sutras, and then all that was commentated upon by the great Indian masters in the 205 volumes, sorry, 215 volumes of the, the Tengur, as they say. Where the uh, Shastras, uh, then that has been distilled down into 14 verses. Okay. And so um, it's interesting because um, you know last night we had a session on how to you know, integrate Buddhism into daily life. But one of the benefits of the, the Lamrim genre, the Lamrim teachings, is that all of the teachings appear as personal instructions for practice. Right? Right? So, hmm, does that? Yes? So what that means is, actually, if you know the Lamrim well, then this question about, oh, how should I practice this? how do I integrate this into my daily life, actually may, might not come up. What do you think? Yeah. So. Nonetheless, sometimes, I mean, I, I appreciated last night's session because sometimes it, was, it wasn't so much, um, a lot of the questions were very thoughtful where we tried to, you know, have these very lofty ideals, and we're here, and we need to figure out how to get from where we are to where we want to go. Anyway, so um, with that brief introduction, let's just jump into the text. Okay? Alright. Uh, so, three principles of the path Lamsun, Lamsun, and here I'm going to go based on both uh, translations. Uh, 141. Or, or you have it memorized? <laughs> you have it memorized? I have the same as five What's that? Yes, I memorized it. I have. I need to see it for five minutes, then I need to see it. You hear her? She said, I have it memorized, but. I have it, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, you've memorized it and then you forgot it. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Dusha, from time to time, I've, I've taught you little, um, you know, American English expressions. Okay. Idioms. You know what the idiom is? Okay. So here's one. The check is in the mail. 
the check is in the mail. You know what that means? So it's like, you know, you, you owe your rent to your landlord on the first of the month. You haven't paid. <laughs> and you run into your landlord. And you say, oh yeah, the check is in the mail. I paid you. You just haven't received it yet. Okay? Anyway, I'm joking. Alright. One of the benefits of this text, actually, is you can do what uh, Vashon did and memorize it. You know, 14 stanzas? It's not, it's not uh, that much, right? If you memorize one stanza a day, you'd be done in two weeks, right? One stanza a day. That's not so much, right? And then you have this very profound text at your fingertips, well, at your mental fingertips. And then, you know, when you're stuck in traffic, Right? Instead of, I don't know, playing Angry Birds, or whatever. What, what do the kids play these days? There's that Jewel one. Do people with guys like five years ago? Bejeweled? Whatever you, you, you guys do. Right? Instead of doing that, you can then reflect on the remnant. How's that? Pretty good, right? Hmm. I mean, of course, if you don't have it memorized, then <laughs> don't say, okay, I don't have it memorized. I'll the angry birds. You can then, you know, look at these, this text, you know, on your phone. Okay, anyway. So, uh, expression of homage. You'll see this in, in many of the, the texts at the beginning. Um, so, just know, know that that's the case. And why is that done? is done, uh, you know, historically, um, it is said, you know, before one t undertakes a project, you know, we talked about, you know, karma a little bit, right? Karma being the cause of success, right? And anything you want to accomplish uh, that's positive, you need a, a lot of, uh, you know, good karma. To, to bring the success you're seeking. <clears throat> so, when you uh, pay homage to a uh, you know, exalted being, like for example, your perfect gurus, then one accumulates a lot of merit. One also uh, has a lot of purification that can purify the obstacles for completing the text. So that's one thing. Okay, then the promise to compose. Uh, so this is also found in, in many of the, the texts. Um, the author basically now kind of singing um, the why this text is being composed. And I'll also give you a, a bit of insight into the subject matter of the text. Right? And I'll talk about the purpose the kind of near-term purpose and the ultimate purpose. So, um, Shanti Yajnik. You playing Angry Birds over there? So, Shanti, I'm going to embarrass you now. Okay? A little, little bit. It's okay? So Shanti, um, you've studied the Bodhisattva Chara Bhattara, right? Yes, Sandhya. In the first chapter, right? Yes, Sandhya. So, do you know the promise to compose in, in that text? He says he wants to familiarize it with his mind, so he is writing it down. And okay. if other people like himself are there, they can benefit from it as well. Yes. Very and good. he says there's nothing new there for everything. It's all from new. the... He's not skilled in poetry, but he's, he's uh, you know, you, um, he's writing in accord with the instructions of the previous masters. Right? 
so in order to familiar, familiarize himself, and then if others um, also benefit, then that's good. Right? So there you can see the subject matter is the instructions uh, on bodhicitta by previous masters. Right? The near term purpose, I mean, he's saying to familiarize his mind, but also implied with that is the other people, they can also familiarize their minds. And the ultimate purpose is, after having familiarized their mind with these instructions of the Bodhisattva, eventually they'll attain enlightenment. Okay? Alright. So, um, yeah. Here, the promise to compose. <clears throat> The essential meaning of the victorious one's teachings, the path praised by all the holy victors and their children, the gateway of the fortunate ones, the Zion liberation, this I shall try to explain as much as I can. Okay. So, maybe at the beginning, right, we should say a little bit. Uh, so what are these three principles of the path? Hmm? Here they translate it as, if you just look at the headings, there's renunciation, the mind of enlightenment, or bodhicitta, and then the right view. Okay? Renunciation, bodhicitta, and the right view. Okay? So those are the three. See, here is principles P L E S, um, but a more literal translation, you know, we have this nam so nam sum. Okay? So so. So wo means like main, principal, P A L, right? Like the main. Nam is aspect. So you'll, you'll sometimes see it as the three principal aspects of the path, right? Um, but it, it's, it's a little bit strange, right? Because there's this homonym in the English language P L E, you know, principal, right? P-A-L means either the person who is in charge of the school. Yeah, right? And how I, we knew that, how we learned it in school is, you know, the pal is the person, right? The prince is your pal, right? Okay, the head of the school. Or, principal, same spelling, also means like main. Okay, a little bit confusing. So here, then when they put... PLE, meaning like, like a, a principle, you know, like the, the, the principle of nonviolence or the principle of, uh, you know, yeah, some kind of you know, justice, something like this. You got it? Alright. So, so, which one it should be? Should it? So, see, this, because it says soul wall, right? It actually means main, okay? But when we talk, the literal translation, the three principal aspects of the path, then they're saying these main aspects of the path is a principle, P-L-E, right? Right? So you can say, you know, those three, renunciation, bodhicitta, and right view, they are principles, P-L-E, that are important within Buddhism, and they're also the main aspects or, or yeah, things that, that one is to practice along the path of the mind. Right. So, yeah, it's okay. Anyway, the point is <coughs> here, in this promise to compose, okay, so actually before we get to that, Let's just say a little, little bit, right? Renunciation means the wish to, you know, definitely be free from samsara and suffering and attain liberation. Bodhicitta is the wish to be fully enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And the right view is the correct uh, philosophical view of ultimate reality. In other words, shunyata. In other words, that things are lacking in inherent existence. Okay? That's the right view, how things exist on the ultimate nature. Okay.
So, then this one stanza, Promise to Compose, remember we were saying, usually the Promise to Compose also tells you something about the subject matter, right? Mm, so here's saying, and actually these first three lines each correspond to one of the three principles. So the essential meaning of the Torah's one's teachings, okay, that is renunciation. Okay? Means, okay, we, we look, the we, we touched on this before, but the, the first teaching that the Buddha gave after he was enlightened in uh, Sarnath, near you know, present-day Varanasi in Deer Park, was the Four Noble Truths. That forms the basis, uh, foundation, that's common across all the various Buddhist traditions. Right? And that basically is right that there's suffering, suffering has a cause, there's a, a cessation of suffering, and there's a way to get out of suffering. Right? So that's the you know essential meaning Renunciation means there is a higher goal, this nirvana, moksha, liberation, that we all can achieve. And therefore, we need to set our aspirations to that, not just to have uh, you know, some kind of um, pleasant life within samsara. Okay? That's the very essence, and that's why the Buddha taught that first. The path praised by all the holy victors and their children. Okay? So holy victors are the Buddhas, their children, the Bodhisattvas. Okay? Alright. So what what is the path praised by those? Bodhicitta. Okay? So we were saying Bodhicitta, this wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. A little, little bit of just to lay out. There's nirvana, a kind of individual liberation for oneself alone, where one no longer takes rebirth within samsara. It's a kind of personal liberation. But then, there's a higher goal of full enlightenment. Right? So, if you know a little bit about the history, uh, of you know the, the Buddha and his disciples, so there was, of course, the historical Buddha. Then his main disciples. You hear about Ananda, Shariputra, Moggallana, so forth. So Moggallana, Shariputra, they had achieved that state of liberation, Nirvana, for themselves. But they weren't Buddhas, right? They didn't have all the. They weren't omniscient like the Buddha was, right? So there's this difference in their goals. Okay. So in order to attain the state of full enlightenment, one needs that mind of bodhicitta. Okay. So therefore, this path, the path of bodhicitta, practicing this altruism that extends to all sentient beings, that's an uncommon characteristic of the Buddhas and their children, the Bo means bodhisattvas. When one achieves this mind of bodhicitta in an uncontrived way, one becomes a bodhisattva. Okay? So, the, these two are what we call the Mahayana, Mahayanaists, or whatever. Tekchenpas, right? The ones who follow the Mahayana. And the distinguishing characteristic, the uncommon characteristic, is bodhicitta. Hi. When you have the mind of bodhicitta arising in an uncontrived, sort of spontaneous, effortless manner. Okay. The gateway of the fortunate ones, the Zion liberation. Okay. <coughs> so here, you know, the gateway, or like the doorway, right? If you want to come into this center, you, there's only one door, you have to come through that. Right? So similarly, if you desire liberation, right, we had, I had identified this ignorant mind grasping to true existence as being the root cause of samsara. If you want to be liberated, you have to get rid of that. If you want to get rid of that misapprehension of reality, you have to realize the reality as it is. So, that's the right view. 
the right view is the gateway to fortunate ones desiring liberation. If you want liberation, you have to realize emptiness. There's no other way. <clears throat> okay? So then, those three are the three principles of the path, and this <coughs> Lama Sumpapa shall try to explain as much as he can. Oh, Hi. Yeah, so the, the right is still the gateway, it's not the main group. Like realizing emptiness is the gateway to liberation. Like once you realize emptiness, it's not like you're liberated. So, no. So they still call it the gateway. It's necessary but not sufficient. It's not sufficient. Yeah. You need it. But even after you realize it, you have to continue to meditate on it. You know, so first you'll you'll realize it in a conceptual manner. Continue wow. to meditate, meditate, meditate. You realize it in a non-conceptual manner. Meditate, meditate, meditate. And then you'll every time you have a direct realization of emptiness, you'll be abandoning some of the obscurations to liberation. And then at a certain point, you will fully abandon those. So when they're saying the gateway, they mean it in a, in a conceptual, in a theoretical way. Well, well so, so, you know, um, like the cake that's coming soon, okay? It's going to be served over there. So people who want that cake, they're going to have to come through that doorway, right? That's the way to get the cake. But just because they've entered doesn't mean, you know, they've had it, right? So. It's the gateway in the sense that, you know, without it, there's no way to achieve liberation. But, you know, there's still more work to do even after you've realized it. But, you know, the main... Once you have that initial realization, then you're doing quite okay. Because all that it then is, is repeated familiarization based on something you already know. You've already sort of cracked the code, so to speak, you know? Does the realization here mean like a spark of enlightenment over oh, see it's all empty? Or does the realization mean that every second or every moment, like I see it? No, 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 no. Not every second. It just is, is the, the first realization. Okay. That's the then, you know, <clears throat> at, the, at the beginning stages, because you're going to first have to use inference, right? You have that aha moment for lack of, you know, better analogy, right? Then, okay, you realize that, okay, fine. Then you go on with your daily life, you eat lunch, okay? <laughs> then in the afternoon session, okay? You'll have to kind of revise that reasoning, the analytic process, and then you'll realize it again, right? And you'll still have to keep putting in effort for a while. Much later, uh, you won't have to have a like a, a gross effort. Yeah. You can have a, a subtle effort. Like I want to, I want to think about emptiness, and it'll happen like that, right? But you'll still have to like I want to think about emptiness. But then once you are enlightened, a Buddha, then you're realizing the emptiness of all phenomena with every one of your. There's, there's just spontaneous realization. Okay? Alright. Now the persuading to listen. <coughs> okay, so also, also, the, these touch on the, the three principles. So, those who are not attached to the pleasures of circling, that, uh, you know, demonstrates renunciation. who strive to make freedom and endowments meaningful. So we had mentioned freedom and endowments, we'll see this, as being the, the characteristics, the, there's 18 characteristics of what is called the precious human rebirth. Okay? We'll get into this uh, in a little bit. But that basically, what we mentioned at the beginning, we have all the outer and inner circumstances to make utmost progress along the path to enlightenment. So now that we have this, how we make this human body most meaningful, since we have the opportunity to 
attain full enlightenment, then we need to make progress along that path to full enlightenment. And how do we do that? We need to have the wish to achieve full enlightenment. We need to have bodhicitta. Without it, then even no matter what kind of great things we do, it won't become the cause for enlightenment. So bodhicitta is, is referred to in the second line. Who entrust themselves to the path pleasing the victorious ones. Okay? So that talks about right view. So, uh, as it said, right, the victorious ones, it means the Buddhas, have compassion for all sinning beings. They want all sinning beings to be free from suffering. But as you know, uh, you know, the Buddhas do not wash away sins with, our, our sins with water, nor do they remove the sufferings with their hands, nor do they transfer their meditations to another mind shoe. But the Buddhas liberate sinning beings by teaching the reality. Right? So the Buddha can't do it for us, right? But the Buddha liberates us, how? By teaching this right view, and then it's up to us to do the rest of the work. Therefore, when we, you know, realize emptiness, <laughs> it's really pleasing to the Buddhas, because they then see, oh, okay, that's one fewer sending being, you know, who's going to be suffering. Really? They would, they, they would do it for us if they could, but they can't. So you fortunate ones listen to the calm mind. section on how to listen to the teachings, right? Means, you know, I mean, do I have to explain? If you're listening to, you know, some kind of lecture, you have to be concentrated, you have to be focused, and so they normally talk about the three faults of a, of a container, right? If you, there's an upside down container, someone comes and wants to pour, Delicious. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Porridge. Porridge. Yeah. What do we want? It's a little bit hot today. So a nice um, fresh lime soda. Hmm. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a liquid. Liquid. Fresh lime soda. Sweet salty mix. Okay. Look, huh? You ha how do you have your first time soda? <laughs> okay. However you want it. It is upside down. The cup is upside down. The can't pour in. Okay. So that's like you come to the teachings and you're not paying attention. Or what we saw a little bit last night. I don't mean to scold, but they're not here. People chatting with their neighbors, maybe some people, you know, checking their phones, not paying attention, upside down pot, nothing's going to come in, right? So we have to avoid that. Second is, you know, if there's a hole in it. Where, oh yeah, last time I had a first time solo, they brought in a paper cup. So what? Yeah. Luckily it didn't have a hole. But you can imagine, you know, a little hole in, in that paper cup. Then, even though it's, it's nice, you know, you have it on the, the thing, you eat something in your tally, next thing you know, it's empty, it's gone, everything is spilled out. So similarly, that means even though we listen to the teaching, if we just sort of leave it at that, you know, eventually we're going to forget. So 
it's going to require some you know, revision, some effort on our, on our part, right, to study, revise, read different commentaries and so forth. And the last one is a you know, dirty cup, right? If the bottom of the cup is, is dirty or unclean, you're not going to want to drink that. So that refers to having a proper motivation for coming to the teaching, uh, meaning not with attachment to worldly, mm, you know, worldly thoughts of, oh, when I understand these teachings, I'll be, I don't know, famous. Or, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what people might think. Right? So then avoiding those three faults, then we listen. I, I think I think clear is better. I don't know. Because clear then gives that. Clear means free of the three faults of a vessel. But yeah, calm mind, whatever you want to say. That's the best thing you Okay? Pure. I'm just looking at my, my uh, dictionary. So yeah, like faithful mind. Anyway. Okay, so now the purpose of generating renunciation. Without the complete intention, definitely to be free from circling, there is no way to pacify attachment seeking pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling. Also, by craving for sight of existence, embodied beings are continuously bound. Therefore, at the very beginning, seek renunciation. So, uh, you see, circling, uh, you might know it as samsara, right? Or sometimes translated as cyclic existence. So it's called a cycle because it's this process of continual rebirth, uncontrolled rebirth due to our karma and afflictions. Yeah? Now, mm, one of the reasons why we um, emphasize so much the motivation when we you know, start teaching or, or, or do anything, really, is, um, you see, without this wish to achieve liberation, then our actions don't become the cause for liberation. Without the wish to achieve complete enlightenment, our actions don't become the cause for complete enlightenment. So, see, without the complete intention, definitely to be free from circling, <clears throat> that is this mind of renunciation. So without the mind of renunciation, then <clears throat> there's no way to pacify attachment, seeking pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling. Okay, so what does that mean? <clears throat> pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling would be to, you know, be reborn as a human, rich, wealthy, uh, good-looking, with, uh, you know, a lot of friends, power, fame, all that, right? So that would be a pleasurable effect, yeah? Pretty good, but it's still in the ocean of circle, okay? So this is uh, a little bit just something those of you who have studied Lam Rim a bit more, right? Lam Rim, they talk about it, there's the three types of spiritual practitioner, three types of Dharma practitioner. Here we have the three principles, 
but there it has the three, the kebu sum, the three persons. And there, there's the small, small scope practitioner or the small capability practitioner. And their goal for their practice is to attain a good rebirth in their next life. The middle, the middle scope practitioner, the middle capable, capable being, is to attain liberation from samsara. And the great scope practitioner is to attain full enlightenment. Okay. So this small scope practitioner is seeking pleasurable effects within the ocean of circling. Why? They don't have the middle scope motivation. So without that middle scope motivation, then max we can do is, uh, you know, the small scope goal. Now, if we then, with that motivation to attain a good rebirth in our next life, we then, you know, abandon uh, negativities, if we then practice generosity, because from generosity comes wealth, right? We will then get a good rebirth and, you know, be like, uh, I don't know, wealthy, right? Um, if we practice patience, instead of getting angry, you know, ugly face, we practice patience as a cause for beauty, right? So the, the, the law of cause and effect is still in operation, but depending on the level of our motivation, that same thing, the same action of uh, you know, charity, say, if done with the mere wish to attain wealth in a future life, it will become the cause of that. But if we do it instead, same action with a mind of renunciation from samsara, that will become the cause for us to um, attain liberation. And we do the mind of Chiba will become the cause for them. Okay? <clears throat> so then also, by craving for psychic existence, embodied beings are continuously bound. Right? So here, you see, even craving, craving for a good rebirth within psychic existence, we're creating the karma to be reborn in psychic existence. So that's furthering our, our uh, bondage, right? So for these reasons, at the very beginning, seek renunciation. Okay? Sign up. That way has the... The cake is not yet done. So we have okay. to move on to the cake comes. Okay. You can carry on. Other things ready, but you can carry on. Yes. That's how it is. You can continue to tell us the means to, to get liberation from samsara yeah, exactly. until <laughs> more samsara comes. But <laughs> until the pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling. Yes. Practitioners are kind of included. I mean, they are included. 
But but are the smaller school people also included? I so let me get to this next one. I'll show you. Okay. All right. So now we're on number four. How then to generate renunciation? Okay. Freedom and endowments are difficult to find, and life has no time to spare. By gaining familiarity with this, attraction to the appearances of this life is reversed. By thinking over and over again that actions and their effects are unbetraying, and repeatedly contemplating the miseries of cycling existence, attraction to the appearances of future lives is reversed. Okay. So this will answer both your questions. Okay. So, in uh, other texts, like this, you know, there's a great Sakya text uh, called Parting from the Four Attachments. And in there, it says, well, I don't know the exact translation, but something like, if you have attachment to this life, you're not a Dharma practitioner. If you have attachment to samsara, you don't have renunciation. If you have attachment to your own purpose, you don't have bodhicitta. And if you have attachment to, uh, you know, true existence, you don't have the view. Okay? So, well, four attachments. Then, uh, this one, you see the three principles. There's just renunciation. But then, when Lama Sankhava is commentating on it, you see the renunciation broken into two. Right? So this first stanza, <clears throat> attraction to the appearances of this life is reversed. Then, uh, attraction to the appearances of future lives is reversed. So, the practices of the small scope then is renunciation of the attraction to the appearances of this life. That is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Then, the, what normally is in the middle scope is the attraction of getting over the attraction to the appearances of future lives. Right? Okay, you got it? So, they are in in included the subject matter is all there, but Lama Sankhava in this text is is uh, as you say, clubbing them together, right? In in this renunciation, so both of those, right? It's a type of renunciation. Remember, we we're saying renunciation isn't like, oh, I don't want that, but it's to set your goal for something higher, right? To think, you know. Uh, seeing the relative drawbacks of samsara and the relative advantages of nirvana, you set your goals and say, I definitely must attain nirvana. So in a similar way, you see the relative disadvantages of lower rebirth and the relative advantages of a higher rebirth, and you say, oh, between those two, oh my gosh, in my next life, I definitely need to get another human rebirth. So it is a type of renunciation. Okay? So, let's get into it. Freedom and endowments <clears throat> are difficult to find. So again, these are the qualities, yes. Yes. <clears throat> so, if you have attachment to this life, you are not a Dharma practitioner. If you have attachment to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you have attachment to your own purpose, own purposes, own desires, or whatever, then you don't have bodhicitta, if you have attachment to true existence, or you know, clinging to the view, you don't have uh, emptiness, or you know, power, uh, the right view. Okay? So, that's the stanza, if you want, then you can figure out what the four things, or what the four attachments are. The attachments are attachment to this life, attachment to samsara, attachment to your own purpose, and attachment to true existence. Hmm? So basically, it, it maps us, as she said, to the, the three scopes. As you always say, attachment to your own purpose, you know, thinking of others, and then you always say attachment to your view. Uh, well, you see, in the full-fledged three scopes, the right view is included in both the middle scope and the great scope. So, you know, at the end of the middle scope, 
Lama Sankhapa says, if he were to really give a full teaching, he would talk about emptiness now, but since this is a you know, Mahayana text, he's going to do it at the end in the terms of the six perfections. So, yeah, just yeah, keep that in mind. I think I have a question when it translates to practice also. There's always that thinking, should, should you focus practicing and learning more about wisdom of emptiness, or you should start practicing, uh, you know, bodhicitta practices also, the six perfections. So, is it most, should, should we do all together, or should we take it, you know, in a sequential manner, like, you know, maybe we are more small scope focus there and then move on? So, it's, it's probably the final question also is in terms of practices. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that is uh, uh, something to think about. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'll answer it now. Um, but, um, see, some of these things, you know, when we're on stanza four, it's like, you know, the big picture stuff, I want to get through the entire text and then say how to integrate it all into practice. But in short, then yes, we should do it all and we should do it sequentially. Right? At one given time, we can't meditate on both bodhicitta and emptiness. Okay? In one mind. <clears throat> so what we do in a practical way, we go through these texts, and if we're reading, you know, like the Lemon Chenmo, then you know you read from the beginning to the end. And then you might spend topics, you know, a certain amount of time on each particular topic. You go through it all, and then you start over again at the beginning. So you're not waiting for the realization of the precious human rebirth to go on to the next one. But uh, you have to start somewhere, and you will, if you start at the beginning, you know, do that, that meditation. Freedom and endowments are difficult to find and life has no time to spare. So freedom and endowments is what we are saying. These qualities of a fully characterized precious human rebirth that allows us to make the utmost progress along the path to enlightenment. Okay? So they include, you know, uh, as we said at the beginning, the outer qualities of being born in a time and place where the Buddha's teachings exist, and then the inner qualities of having faith in the teachings, uh, having enough mental acuity to understand the teachings. Uh, well, there's another technical one about not having committed a very heavy negative karma. For example, like killing your parents, that would then uh, create obstacles for you to gain realizations in this life. Anyway, uh, for our purposes now, just know that having all of these 18, you know, it's like the stars aligning, and they're very rare to come all at once. So they're difficult to find. Uh, so that is showing the, the teachings on the precious human rebirth. Then, uh, life has no time to spare. Uh, this is the teaching then on uh, impermanence and death. Okay? So, uh, no time to spare. Let's see. The other translation says, yeah, same, uh, means, well, really, we're going to die, death can come at any time, and, uh, well, it, it also says that at our time of death, then, you know, we're separated from our possessions, we're separated from uh, our friends, loved ones, and we're also separated from even our own bodies. So, uh, these things that we normally spend a lot of time, uh, protecting, accumulating, taking care of, then those also, uh, you know, they're not going with us into the next life. And so, um, well, what does our state of development of the mind, 
the karmic imprints that we've uh, accumulated on this mind. So then, the uh, by gaining familiarity with this, attraction to the appearances of this life is reversed. Right? So, seeing that all those things of this life aren't going with us to the next life, then the kind of infatuation, the attraction we have to those things, uh, then uh, gets reversed. Hmm? So, by thinking over and over again that actions and their effects are unbetraying and repeatedly contemplating the miseries of psychic existence, attraction to the appearances of future lives is reversed. Alright. So this then is showing, a, 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 again, a brief way, uh, the middle scope, right? Where, whereas in the so-called small scope, in that previous stanza, we talked about uh, you know, comparing the relative advantages of a good rebirth versus a lower rebirth, Seeing, comparing the two, we then choose for a higher rebirth. But here again, in the, um, the middle scope, we think of the miseries of all of psychic existence, not just the miseries of or the suffering of the lower rebirths. Okay? And so, um, there are different ways to think about those miseries of psychic existence. We have the so-called three types of suffering, the six types of suffering, the eight types of suffering. Okay, but um, here the main one that uh, Sankara is talking about, right? Action and their effects are unbetraying. Okay, so this is the law of, of karma, and what that then means, right? Um, well, one. Even if we want to attain a good rebirth in our next life, right? If we haven't uh, abandoned the cause of samsara altogether, namely the karma and the afflictions, then even if we get a good rebirth in our next life, the one after that is unclear. And since we have countless karmic imprints in our mind streams from the gameless time, and by the way, most of those are negative karmic imprints rather than positive ones, then sooner or later, we're going to um, get again reborn in the lower realms. Okay? So even getting rebirth in the higher realm in our next life is not a stable, permanent uh, solution. Okay? Mm. So in the Sangata Sutra, it says, you know, those who fear the hell realms should not seek the devil realms. You understand? You understand? Why? Here, right? Seeking pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling, right? We might think, oh, I want to be born as a deva. So we do some kind of virtue, then we're born as a deva. Pretty good, right? Well, after that karma runs out, then surely we are to fall again back into the lower realms. That's why uh, Arya Deva in the 400 stanza says, you know, uh, yeah, basically the wise, they, they fear the, the upper realms as much as they fear the lower realms. There is like, no place within samsara that does not uh, bring this fear. Uh, some bad translation. Sorry. But that's the point, right? So these, even, even the middle school practitioner, they're viewing all of samsara as problematic, as a fire pit of, of suffering. Okay? And that's actually, you know, one of the main contemplations of the misery of psychic existence, this uh, suffering of uncertainty. Right? So of course, even in this life, <clears throat> we might you know, have uh, good status, good health, good job, and then, especially in the last two years, we've seen a lot of impermanence. So all, all that can even you know, go away, even with, within one life. But then, when we think across lives, then, you know, 
the, the contemplations in the, in the, the Dhammapada, I believe, that the king becomes the beggar, right? Those who are, um, you know, born in the, in the, the Deva realms who have a, a kind of glowing body, then they're reborn in a, um, a dark existence. Like in, in, they say in the, the cold hells, it's completely dark and they can't even see like this far away from their nose. Anyway, so in samsara, cycle of rebirth. Therefore, attractions, you yeah, know, thinking of that, attractions to the appearances of future lives is reversed. Right. Yeah, you don't want to uh, settle for merely a good rebirth in your next life. You can see the only sort of goal is to achieve liberation from some sort. Okay, so then, the next time the definition of having generated renunciation. One having uh, trained in that way, there is no arising even for a second of attraction to the perfections of psychic existence. And all day and night, the intention seeking liberation arises, then the thought of renunciation has been generated. Okay? That's easy enough. Right? So, you know. It's always good to give a reality check, right? Because it's very easy, you know, at the beginning of today's session, we had a kind of contrived, we're doing this for the benefit of all sane beings, and therefore we're going to achieve a for the benefit of all sane beings. All this, right? But, see, no rising even for a second of attraction to the perfections of psychic existence, and all day and night, the intention seeking liberation arises. Hmm. Then the thought of renunciation has been generated. In other words, maybe we have a little bit more work to do. Hmm? What do you think? Says here perfections of the psychic existence. Does it mean like good, unquote perfections, or it means perfections? Well, it, it, it's uh, hold on. Yeah. So that are going to be called So of course, it's not it's not the perfection in the sense when you talk about like perfection of wisdom, right? right? But, uh, you know, probably Pumso, right? It's a kind of a Tibetan, a lot of Tibetans have that name. I've seen that translated as like marvels, good things. But see, Koroe Pumso, it's like the good things of psychic existence. So, I mean, yeah, maybe. They're trying to be, yeah, the good things of psychic like, existence. Yeah, wealth, health, fame, you know, these kinds of things. Oh, okay, yeah, so splendors, something like, something like that. So, yeah, but you should know, like, the real perfection is not found in, in psychic existence. So, it's not, you know, it's not that kind of literal. Um, um, let me just uh, distinguishment, excellence, abundance. Something like that, right? Okay. Now, where are we? The purpose of generating the mind of enlightenment. Could I ask a question? Yes. So, when, let's, let's say a motivation for seeking the perfections of psychic existence is so that you have greater opportunity for the highest goal, like to achieve liberation for the sake of others. Yeah. 
Is that like a good motivation for? Like, so you are still in smaller scope, but you are seeking smaller scope so that you have better. Like for example, I have a better opportunity to practice dharma than a guy who is selling fruits on the street. Yes, you do. Right? And yeah. then the guy, let's say, who is ultra rich, who is born in, like Jeff Bezos' son, mm. who have better opportunity than me. But then. Yeah, I, 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 get, I, get, I get your point. So, uh, to, to answer that, then, you know, you see, merely wishing for wealth or good health isn't necessarily even a small scope practitioner. You can, with a mind of bodhicitta, right, say, I want to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, you know, therefore I want to be, uh, you know, a wheel turning king. Right. But that, that's already great scope. Even if you're thinking, yes. even if we have a mind of hope, then we are not even in the small yeah. scope. We're right. just getting the, we're yeah. just getting people to the... Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I often put it like this. You see, uh, let's take this one as the Lama as an example. You know, that kind of great enlightened being, it's, it's better for all sentient beings the more famous he is. And, you know, if he had, you know, 100 billion or whatever, you know, ultra rich, that the world would be a better place because he would do good things with it, right? So, in general, you know, uh, okay, even putting that aside for a second, even like Lama Tsongkhapa, in his life, he, um, he undertook wealth practices. Atisha also did the Zambala practice. Right? You know, this is wealth practice, right? So it's very popular. It's very popular in Singapore, right? Man, if we were in Singapore and we, like, I was giving a talk on Zambala, it would be like people out the door, right? Really. Maybe they have bodhicitta, I'm not sure, but that's just the, the thing, right? But, you know, these masters, Atisha, Ram Sankhapa, he did the, those wealth practices, but why? Sankhapa then, you know, he, one of his four great deeds was to refurbish, is it here? This uh, great Maitreya statue that had kind of fallen in disres uh, disrepair. And to sort of, it was a huge statue. That, that, um, like tradition of building large Maitreya statues was well, it was over in Bishay didn't make it up. It was there in, in, in uh, a long time ago. Oh yeah. So even that, right, wanting to acquire wealth can be done with uh, you know a mind of uh, what did she say? A mind of compassion. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. So, uh, the purpose of generating the mind of enlightenment. Even if renunciation has been developed, if it is not possessed by the mind of enlightenment, it does not become the cause of the perfect bliss of unsurpassed enlightenment. Therefore, the wise generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. Okay. So this is a concept we talked about before, remember? If we, you know, uh, do a positive action without the mind of renunciation, then it doesn't become a cause for liberation. If we do an action without the mind of bodhicitta, then it doesn't become the cause for the perfect bliss of unsurpassed enlightenment. Even if you have renunciation. Therefore, the wise generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. How to generate the mind of enlightenment. Next section. Swept away by the current of the four powerful rivers, tied by the tight bound, bonds of karma so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self grasping, completely enveloped by the total darkness of ignorance, endlessly reborn inside the existence, 
sees the tormented by the three sufferings, thinking that all mothers are in such a condition, generate the screen line of enlightenment. Okay? All right. All right. So, uh, usually in the commentaries, uh, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. All right, so let's just go through kind of line by line, right? So, swept away by the current of the, far, of the four powerful rivers. So, this is um, birth, aging, sickness, and death. Okay? So, now that we are born with this type of body, Sometimes you'll see it referred to as the contaminated appropriated aggregates. Anyway, it's this kind of uh, samsaric body. Then we're bound to, you know, take, take birth, get old, get sick, and die. So just like, you know, a, uh, a leaf thrown on the surface of a river, it just goes down the river. Similarly, we are swept away means we don't have control to stop those four uh, powerful rivers. Tied by the tight bonds of karma so hard to endure. So, hmm? uh, oh, undo, yes. So hard to undo, okay? So here, right, um, in general, when we talk about karma, then um, it's this law of cause and effect, and mm, the four sort of guiding principles of, of karma is that uh, karma is definite, means from our negative actions come suffering, from our positive actions come, well, relative benefit, yeah? and then karma increases, so from small actions can come large effects, and then uh, we don't experience something we haven't accumulated the cause for in the past, right? Or, in other words, everything we experience is the ripening effect of the that we've done. And then lastly, that uh, actions done are not wasted. Mm -hmm. So, what that means is, having uh, accumulated the, the, the cause, means accumulating the karma, uh, it's not wasted, means even if it takes a very long time, if we haven't purified that karma, then we're bound to experience its right and effect sooner or later. Hmm? Okay. Caught in the iron net of self-grasping. So here, self-grasping means this uh, grasping on Right? Believing that the self is inherently existent, existent from its own side. And, um, you know, just like uh, a net, right, captures whatever kind of prey, right, and then the, whatever animal, okay, we're not condoning hunting animals, but just as a, give the analogy, right, then a net you know, uh, the animal gets caught in it, it can't get out. So similarly, the, the iron means even harder, right? It can't be cut. This self-grasping that we have, we're completely entangled in, very hard to get out. Okay? Completely enveloped by the total darkness of ignorance. Hmm? So, Ignorance is, is often referred to as a kind of darkness, uh, you know, darkness doesn't allow us to see. So similarly, due to our ignorance, then, um, yeah, we can't see the truth of reality. So then because of that, we're endlessly reborn in psychic existence. And then, once we're reborn in psychic existence, due to this karma, which is difficult to undo, and this ignorance, then those are the, the, the causes, right? The, you know, in the Four Noble Truths, we have true suffering, true cause. 
The true cause is the karma and the delusions, but the root of it is the ignorance. So then, we have the effect. Endlessly we are born in cycle of existence, where we are ceaselessly tormented by three sufferings. Three sufferings, in this context, is the suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and the suffering. All and suffering. So what does that mean? Suffering of suffering is basically what we normally conceive of as suffering. So, you know, toothaches. You know, sickness, mental, mental and physical suffering, hunger, you know, whatever it is. Suffering of change. So this actually, you see, it's what they call contaminated happiness. Okay. Which in the worldly context isn't suffering. Right? So it would be, you know, we're gonna once the cake comes, you're gonna have a dose of suffering of change. Right? There'll be some pleasant experience, perhaps, right, when we eat the cake. But uh, I like to say that the, the translation is probably better mm, to say unsatisfactoriness. The unsatisfactoriness. Dukkha. Right? Because it doesn't have to be like physical pain. Even the pleasant sensation of eating the, the cake is impermanent in nature. Therefore, it ends. Therefore, ultimately, unsatisfying. Then last, the all-pervasive compounded suffering. A lot of words there, but the point is, you know, pervasive means, you know, going everywhere. All-pervasive. So what that means is, <clears throat> in all of the so-called six realms of, of samsara, then the, this kind of suffering exists. Means, all beings in samsara have not abandoned common afflictions. Okay? So then, when we're born in the higher realms, it's due to positive karma and afflictions. When we're born in the lower realms, it's due to negative karma and afflictions. Right? But that whole process of getting rebirth within samsara is due to the karma and the afflictions. Okay? So, then all pervasive means everywhere within samsara means everywhere that sending beings are uh, bound by these karma and afflictions. Then, since we have this body and mind that is under the kind of control of karma and afflictions, compounded suffering. Compounded, right? Every moment we're experiencing something from you know previous previously accumulated karma, previously accumulated karma. And then Oftentimes, maybe not when we're in deep sleep, but oftentimes we're accumulating more karma that will then ripen as one of the other two types of suffering in the future. Right? So just like, you know, we say compound interest keeps, keeps you know, increasing on its own. We do that. Every moment. Right? Most moments. Well, so, let's say in deep sleep, right, maybe not, or sometimes we could be maybe um, uh, accumulating neutral karma, right, which then doesn't have to necessarily ripen as, you know, so, when we talk about the, the, the three types of suffering, the uh, suffering of suffering is caused by negative karma. Suffering of change is caused by contaminated positive karma. But there's also neutral karma. If we just, for example, you know, you're sitting at your desk, kind of zoning out. I don't know. 
you don't, you don't have a strong affliction motivating you either way. Probably that would be a neutral problem. Uh, or, yeah, again, in deep sleep. Uh, it's probably contaminated if you're not an Arya being. But anyway, you know, in, in the text, it doesn't talk much about neutral karma because it doesn't have the, the, the power to mm, ripen as an experience. So the main ones we're trying to, to abandon is the negative karma. The main one I'm trying to adopt is the positive karma. So, yeah. Okay. So then, thinking that all mothers are in such a condition generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. Alright. So, these first, what is it, six lines talk about yeah, such a condition. That condition is samsara. Okay? Now, this is what I alluded to earlier. In the commentaries, you could, instead of saying that thinking that all mothers are in such a condition, thinking that I am in such a condition, generate the mind of renunciation. Right? So, you got it? This condition, swept away by the current of the four powerful rivers, blah, 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 we're also in the samsara, so that also refers to us. So when we think, you know, in relation to ourselves, oh my gosh, I'm swept away by these four powerful rivers, I'm bound by karma, I'm caught in the iron net of self-grasping, oh my gosh, I'm endlessly tormented by three sufferings, I gotta get out. I don't want this anymore. That's the mind of renunciation, basically, right? Definite. Uh, I have to get out of this burning fire pit of samsara. But, see here, nothing in ourselves, thinking instead, all mothers are in such a condition. So all mothers and human beings. And here we use the mind, uh, thinking that all sinning beings have been our mother, to generate a sense of closeness to them. Right? Because typically the, the mother is the, the, the one that we can generate a, a sense because, you know, they've, they've been kind to us, they've raised us, right? So then we think, oh, I need to repay that kindness. So then you have uh, this sense that all sinning beings, you know, one time or another, from the beginning of Samsara Rebirth, have been our mother in the past. When they were our mother, they showered us with various kinds of kindness, and now they're in such condition. So, I don't want them to be in such a suffering state. That mind is the mind of compassion, karuna, right? Wishing that others be free from suffering. Yeah. But it's not enough just to think, kind of, oh, I wish, uh, I wish my mothers weren't in such a state, because what does that do? You know? I wish you have a piece of chocolate cake right now. Um, you wish that all you want. Yeah. I can't eat your wish. Right? So we didn't have to do something more than that. Okay? And, and um, actually uh, take responsibility to free the beings from their suffering. So not just that I, I wish you have a, a piece of chocolate cake, but I'm going to run out to the bakery and get you a piece of cake. Hmm? So taking responsibility to free the sending beings from their suffering. But then, after that, in technical terms, is what's called the laksam uh, ninje, or the extraordinary aspiration. Not just, I wish you're free from suffering, I wish all sending beings are free from suffering, but I myself will free them from their suffering. Seeing that basically, huh? 
Isn't that dangerous? Venturing. Venturing. No. No. In the in the seven point cause and effect instructions, that's step number six. Okay. We're still not at Borichita. We're just at I take responsibility to free all sane beings when they're suffering. Okay? Then what is left? We have to then analyze our current situation. Am I capable of freeing all sane beings from their suffering? No. Well, I don't know. I'm asking myself. Me? No. Because I myself am not free from suffering. I myself have uh, you know, a lot of faults. So, you know, and, and especially since we're talking about to free others from their suffering, we have to induce realization of emptiness. Then I also have to realize emptiness. So how can I then, you know, induce that realization in someone else? So then we see our current kind of uh, inadequacies in our ability to benefit others. But then we say, well, should I just give up then? No. We say, all right, well, currently I'm like this, but is there something I can do to bolster my inner qualities so I can, you know, benefit them in a real way? Yes. I can achieve enlightenment. Therefore, I'm going to achieve enlightenment. See that thought process? Anyway, when you study a little bit more in depth, you'll go through the, that, that's a very rough seven point cause and effect instructions, right? And just so you know, right, I, I talked about those steps without laying them out. But it's recognizing all sentient beings have been your mother, remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness. And then they call it Yion Ninje, which is a kind of uh, affectionate love, where we see beings as, you know, as our mothers, and then they're near, dear, and lovable to us. And then we have a mind of compassion, wishing that they're free from suffering. Then this extraordinary aspiration, I myself will free them from that suffering. Then the, the, the six B, I can't do it now but if I were attain Buddhahood, I could. Then, seventh, therefore, Bodhicitta, I'm going to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all seven things. Now, D, what you would refer to, right, that, that seven is the wish, right, I will attain enlightenment for the benefit of all seven things. Then, there's the further <laughs> division of Bodhicitta into, you know, aspirational Bodhicitta and engaging or uh, venturing Bodhicitta, where then, you know, just to say, I, I desire to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sinning beings, versus I will then, you know, engage in these practices that lead to enlightenment. Okay? We need some uh, venturing uh, cake aspiration. You can start with the break, the cake, cake should come soon. Maybe we can do it after the session? No, maybe we won't do it. It's okay, we can offer it as one o'clock. Okay, well, so, so look, we are, um, why don't I do this? Because also, some people might need to take a yes. break. We're, just one little thing about uh, the mind of enlightenment. Then we can take a break, cake or no cake, and then we can continue with the right view. In short, if like the mother whose cherished son has fallen into a pit of fire and who experiences even one second of his suffering as an unbearable eternity, your reflection on the suffering of all the sinning beings has made it impossible for you to bear their suffering for even one second, and the wish seeking enlightenment for their sake arises without effort, then you have realized the supreme, precious mind of enlightenment. 
So this stanza actually was not in the original text by Song Kha Bo. Uh, I think it was in the commentary by Paul Grimshaw. Uh, sorry, but in any case, um, you know, just like Wang Sukhaba said before, the definition of having generated renunciation here is a kind of similar contemplation to give us a um, an idea, a kind of benchmark to see <laughs> where we are. They're not here. Uh, well, I'm not going to say their name anyway, but I know someone who comes to the center who uh, I think they think they are the blue I'm not sure. It could be, <laughs> I'm not sure. Wait. Okay. But uh, anyway, so we have to, to really, really check, right? So we don't get an inflated view of ourselves, right? Okay. Mm. Yeah, I think that's easy enough to understand. So why don't we take a break? And, um, we can go, I think that clock is actually five or seven minutes fast. So why don't we have a 15 minute break? Yeah.